Good afternoon. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us for season two of Sharp Talk. I am your host, Rebecca Sharp. And <laughs> my name is Luis Sharp. This is my child, my second oldest daughter. Thank you again for joining us for episode one, season two of Sharp Talk. Got an exciting guest with my fellow UCLA brethren that's going to join us on the show tonight. Thank you for joining us. Yes. Yeah, so without further ado, we have Mike Lodish, who is uh, one of the only players to have played in six Super Bowls. He is a father of one, like my dad mentioned, fellow UCLA Bruin, and a very close and um, wonderful friend to the Sharp family. So without further ado, Mike Lotus. How's it going? Hello, Mike. Thank you so much. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, Louie. How you doing? I'm doing wonderful, Jeff. Fellow Bruin, one of Michigan's favorite sons. Oh, you're Mike. too kind. <laughs> What's the, uh, here, let me pull up his name. Uh, Mick McCabe, named due to... Uh, one of the uh, 50 greatest players in Michigan high school football uh, history. Congratulations on that honor. And uh, pleasure is ours. Uh, privilege to have you join our show. Well, I got to tell you, thank you. It's it's my honor to be a part of your show. And uh, just to mention something about the McCabe, Mick McCabe thing, uh, I think they missed a guy in Lewis Sharp. Okay, so... Uh, a Detroit native as well, um, you know, and uh, a fellow Bruin. And anybody could have made that team. There's a number of people out there that could have made that team. So do I feel blessed that I'm on that? Yes, I do. And I, I thank God every day for the gifts that he's given me. But yeah. I make no mistake that there's many, many great athletes out there that deserve to be on that list. And uh I just, uh, I got to be honest, I'm, I'm very thankful and honored to be a part of it. So I, I hope, uh, you know, you know, you know, Louie, in the, in the league and in school, there's always somebody bigger, stronger and faster somewhere. Right. So, so it, I think the biggest thing is, is to just continue to work hard and, and have a focus and have a drive and look through that conduit and achieve that goal. So thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, and my, my, speaking of working hard and, uh, and having focus, you, as a 10th round draft pick out of UCLA, yep. uh, went on, uh, played, uh, was it nine, 10 years with the Bills? I played 11. Yeah, I got 11. Yeah. Four Super Bowls with the Bills, all losses. Mm -hmm. And then you went and played with the Denver Broncos. Now, did you play with Elway? You played with Elway, right? Yeah, John, I got an opportunity um, to play with uh, – <clears throat> at the time when, uh, um, you know, I was in the league from 1990 to 2000, We Plan B was around, which was – Rebecca, I don't know if you probably ever heard of what Plan B was. Your dad might be able to tell you about. But it was basically you were kind of sequestered to the team after your contract ended. They got the right of first refusal to keep you – you didn't have the right to go and check your free market status, you know. So free agency came around, and and I had an opportunity after my second contract with Buffalo to look at a couple, three different teams, and and Denver, uh, you know, took care of me. They took me out for they flew me first class. They treated me with first class, and ever all the other teams treated me well, but they didn't fly me first class. They you could see that the standard in Denver was. Mike Shanahan at the time and Mr. Bolin, may he rest in peace, really wanted to win a Super Bowl. And I'm not saying I'm the ingredient to the Super Bowl victory because that's a far cry from that. But it was a wonderful honor to be lay with John for four years and watch him in his last two years achieve, you know, his fourth and fifth Super Bowl appearance and then capitalize on a, on a championship, too. So it was it was a. Uh, it was nothing short of amazing. So so tell me something, Mike. I wonder often, how is it that here, here I was, I played 13 years in the NFL. Right. I don't know. You probably weren't in the league. Uh, well, I know you weren't in 1982, but no. we had the strike shortened season. Yeah. And we had what they call the Super Bowl uh, championship because of that strike. Mm -hmm. and that was the only time I had opportunity to make the playoffs. And here you came as a 10th round draft pick. From UCLA, you played in six Super Bowls. Right. So tell me, what what is the key to be on a successful uh, team, reach the ultimate uh, in our industry? I, I chuckle about that because uh, number one, Louis, you were a tremendous offensive lineman, 
and your reputation in the league as a football player preceded you. And you were well, well spoken about. I can tell you that you had tremendous respect and you were an outstanding uh, player. Um, but to, to get lucky enough to go to one Super Bowl and here you played 13 years and never had a chance, maybe one or two playoff games. I think it's luck of the draw. And then for example, uh, here's the irony of my career. My senior year at UCLA, we were three, seven and one. And out of the seven losses, five of those losses, the accumulation of the points we lost by was like 14 points. It, we, we had, we had a heartbreaking season. We lost games by two points, one point. I mean, just we were right in it. It, it, wow. it could have turned. But I played in the Arizona game that year uh, in Tucson, and we got beat really bad. We got beat 42-7. to 7. We, got, we just got smashed. Everything that we put out there, we couldn't defend on defense. But my mentality, Louie, uh, if I had to play against you, is you know that I'm going to come against you every play as hard as I could, right? Now, whether I was successful or not, that's a different story. But but my drive, my motor, I was a motor guy where, Louis, you had those big long arms and you had all the, the physical stature that you needed, you know, the, the politics of being an old lineman or a left tackle or a right tackle. You had to be a certain height. I was six, two and a half, six, three, about 272 pounds. And I kept playing in the Arizona game. And John Butler, who passed away, he was the head of scouting at Buffalo, you know, basically said, the reason we drafted you is because of the way you played in that game. And you never gave up. So your my answer to you is, I'm never going to give up. I'm going to continue to fight and drive and, and give everything that God gave me to give. Whether that's going to be good enough or not, I don't know. But I don't know how to lead by any other example other than to perform the very best that I can. Now, like we said earlier, Rebecca, there's a guy bigger, there's a guy stronger. You know, when we're running 110s and we're getting in shape for practice, there might be a guy faster than me. But I'm still going to give it 100%. But at the end of the day, I believe to play that long and to play in the league at my size, mm -hmm. A, I was good, B, I was really strong, and C, I, I didn't quit ever. And mm -hmm. I, and believe me, I got my butt whipped a few times. <laughs> Trust me, bad. <laughs> you know, it was, it was embarrassing. But uh, I had people that believed in me too, Louie. And Rebecca, and you know that as well as anybody. Greg Robinson, my D line coach at UCLA. I don't know if he was there when you were there. Yeah, Coach but, Robinson. Yeah, Coach Robinson. So he ended up being my D coordinator at the Broncos. So Rebecca, it's not necessarily what you know or how good you are. It's maybe who you know, and then you yeah. still have to be able to close that door behind you that you're good enough to be on the team. I good love work. it. Yeah. Good work. Good work. Very inspirational. And I want to, because it's very evident that you had to have that mindset when you played, you know, at the very height of the National Football League. But I want to bring us back a little bit and talk yeah. about how you learned to be good and strong and to have that warrior mentality mm -hmm. as you grew up in your formative years here in Michigan. So All we right. can call you a Detroit son. You went to uh, Birmingham Brother Rice High School. Not yeah. sure where you went for um, elementary or middle, but I'd like to talk about Sure. Up here in Michigan, and how yeah. it to be born and bred into a represented Michigan in such an incredible way through the national. Yeah. Community. Well, geez, what an how how can I follow that introduction? That's fabulous. <laughs> so, um, but I guess it goes back to, you know, I, I'm going to say it like this: you either have it or you don't. Mm. Bottom okay. line. Okay. Meaning, now. Louis, you had tremendous skills. I, I'm sure you were an extremely intense person, but I was really, really intense, right? So I had to utilize certain things to elevate my game. And so I was a hockey player my whole life, and I didn't play football until I was 14 years old. Okay, interesting. Yeah, my dad played at the University of Notre Dame on a full scholarship. He was a class president from UAD High School in 1955, an all-American football player. Wow. And so I, I came from some pretty good lineage. My grandfather on my dad's side was an Olympic swimmer. And so, and my mom is just a little, we call her the General Patton. General Patton's her nickname, but she's 5'5", 5, 520 pounds. And she's just, you don't want to mess with her. Right? So, <laughs> you know, she's still got the, 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 the resiliency in her, in her. So, you know, I get a lot from my parents. I get a lot from the direction of my parents. I'm 
you know, their support for me because when I was younger, I was uh, severely learning disabled. I was an ADHD kid that wow. had hyperactivity that couldn't sit still, could barely read in second or third grade. And I don't mind sharing that information because nowadays people understand that, boy, this is a situation. We've got to help these kids, you know, and, and, and so it was very difficult. So my, I think I had a little chip on my shoulder. Thank God football and hockey and sports came around and I happened to be pretty good at it, but really it's, something with inside you you know you want to perform like when i look in the mirror i try to look i try to groom myself i try to dress as, as nice as i can because i'm representing myself and my last name when i hit the street right and let me tell you i'm not throwing a stone in a glass house i've done some bad things in my life i've done some stupid things and i've made some, i have some regrets but i think everybody does right but at the end of the day my work ethic is just something about my pride and what i want people when i die i want them to come by and say this guy was the hardest working guy he was an honorable man he had great character and if he said he was going to do something it was going to get done yeah. so that's kind of my my philosophy in life and i brought that to football too and you know lou when you get into the locker room it can be very intimidating as a rookie it can with some of the bigger cats you know the older cats that are in the in the studs and you know, my rookie year, Rebecca, I played at the Bills. Seven Hall of Famers came wow. out of that, that se season. It was the best team I've ever played. I played against uh, LT, which I watched you, Louie, you know, take care of pretty well in your career. So congratulations. That's a hell of a task. But, uh, you know, I, I sat next to Bruce Smith. You know, I sat next to Daryl Talley. I sat next to Shane Conlon. We were all – and I learned from these guys, you know. And, and, and I will tell you this. The Bills were a very selfish team, but I'm going to tell you this about Bruce Smith. Bruce Smith prepared. He said, rookie, you coming with me to watch film? And what was I going to say? No, of course I'm coming with you. You know, <laughs> or I'm watching film. So I think to answer the question, to sum it up, is I just have it within inside me to always want to be the best, right? Vince Lombardi said it the best. Winning isn't a sometime thing. It's an all-the-time thing. But unfortunately, so is losing. You're either a winner or a loser. So those are, and then Coach Fercasa at Brother Rice, who was a big Italian guy, he was a big Lombardi follower. He was a big inspiration to me, Coach Fercasa, for the discipline, getting it done, the agility drills that we had to do that were absolutely brutal when we were in high school, you know, doing a hundred down ups at once, you know, your guys are, you know, vomiting, and doing, but you push through it. So I think all of that combined in my parents and my personal work ethic propelled me to say, I have an opportunity. I'm going to make the best out of it. And I'm going to, and I'm going to make the team. That was my mentality. Thank you for sharing that. That is uh, inspiring. Thank um, you. That is inspiring, Mike. And I noticed that uh, coach for Casa, he labeled you your play the way you played on the field as hostile. I know. Yeah. I, I, I often ask him why he used that word because that can be mis, miscommunicated. Uh, but, Lou, you know as well as anybody. You it's cross, a hostile game. It's a hostile game. You walk out of the locker room. You have your helmet on. You're not buckled up. You light sit on the sideline. You take your helmet off. The Jets come over the field and the National Anthem's playing. You're looking across at the guy on the other side of the field going, it's you and me today. I'm coming. I'm, I'm, I'm be ready. And I know I got to be ready for you. You know, I get me, I get it. But at the end of the day, um, it's a hostile game. And I had to be a little bit more hostile. We'll use coach for Casa's word. Cause I was an undersized interior D lineman. You know, I had to have that, that heart, Rebecca, to play against guys like the size of your dad. I mean, what were you, were you 300 pounds when you played? Yeah, I played between 280 and 300. Yeah. Okay. So, and you're tall with six, 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 five, something like that. Six, six, five. Six, okay. Five, so I got to get up underneath him to even have any leverage. Cause if he leverages me, it's game over. I'm done. <laughs> you know? So, so it was, and it was a scared thing because I was afraid I wasn't going to be successful in the business world because all I knew at the time was football, even though we went to school and I got an economics and history degree, whatever. But I wanted to be in the NFL and I wanted to make that money and I wanted to have, you know, I, that lifestyle, you know, that, that, that I'm an NFL player is what I was looking for. So, so that all motivated me. 
Yeah, and you know, I'm, I thank you so much, especially for really highlighting the learning disability that you yeah. conquered as you were growing up, because I think that there are so many young people that feel like that disqualifies them. But Mike Lotus, your life story, yeah. really your trajectory shows. And I love that you brought up Coach Lombardi. There's a quote um, that I love when he says, the quality of a person's life is in direct proportion to their commitment to excellence, yes. regardless of their chosen field of endeavor. Correct. And so that commitment to excellence, you know, into your family name and your yeah. legacy, all of those things played a tremendous role in yeah. achieving, you know, again, uh, such great success. So thank you for sharing even the humble beginnings because we all, you know, experience different things in growing up, but yeah. there is a greater on the other side, right? If you don't yeah, get you know, and, and, and that's that's wonderful that you uh, bring that up about Coach Lombardi. He's been a very inspirational per person to me. I have a, uh, a framed letter from him, What It Takes to Be Number One by Coach Lombardi in my garage, my man cave. Wow. And it says, uh, you know, basically, you know, you, you need to read it. It's it's it's. A pre it's it, basically in the bold letters, he says, you have to pay the price. And in life, you have to pay the price in everything that you do. And you'll have to pay the price in mistakes that you do. And I think we all are aware of, you know, we've made mistakes in our life and that's okay. But, you know, getting back to the learning disabled thing is I bring that up because I was very embarrassed about it when I was younger. I was very uh, insecure that I wasn't smart or wasn't qualified to be a a business person or what was I going to do with myself? How was I going to make money for my family? And that's what motivated me even more to stay in the league because that was what I was good at. So, you know, I think if anybody has a learning disability or needs any, uh, you know, uh, pep talks or needs any sort of direction, I know a lot of people that can help kids. Uh, you know, my son uh, has, a, has a thing, but we've got him dialed in. He's a 3.5 at Brother Rice. Wow. You know, whether it's medication or whether it's proper tutoring or proper, we have, I've, I've been blessed to have the resources to help him. And I'm going to give everything I can to make sure that he and his mother, uh, he, he and his, him and his mother and I are going to do everything as a team to make sure he gets through. So I've been a single dad for a while and, and uh, you know, but it's all good. And, you know, he's a great kid. And, but I just want people to understand that, you know, you're not, you might not graduate with a 3.0. I graduated with a 2.7 from, from UCLA, but I got my degree and, you know, and, and under the circumstances. So no one can take that from me ever. And, and so was I going to be a doctor or a lawyer? Probably not. Probably wasn't, didn't have the grades to get into the right schools, to get to the right firms, you know, whatever. But at the end of the day, God has a plan for us, as you both know. And, and we, uh, Yep. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. My, my God. So, you know, I'm not the most religious guy, but I'm spiritual and I, I pray on my own and I believe in the things that I believe. And I think that's important that we need to believe in our own beliefs and, and be a good person in society because uh, everybody's got different things, especially in today's day and age with all the racial stuff and all the all the you know, it's just a whole lot of nonsense. You know what I mean? If everybody just wakes up every day with a mindset, regardless of your race, gender, or color, or sexual orientation, is I'm going to be a good person today, and I'm going to work hard, and I'm going to, I'm going to make a contribution to the, to the United States of America. And if we can do that, I think we'll be in good shape, you know? And, and so, you know, it's just been, it's been a tremendous honor for me to, if I die tomorrow, I, I'm, I'm dying with a smile. I had a wonderful life. So, but I don't plan on dying tomorrow. Yeah, we hope that you still No, no, I got 40 more to go. I got four. I'm going 95. I'm going. Yeah, okay, you still got. <laughs> if I can make 95, I'll be good. <laughs> you know, something that I know many people are probably very interested in hearing you talk about, as I mentioned earlier, one of a select few players, I think only three, um, that have played in six Super Bowls. Yeah. Can you share with us what those experiences were like? If there are any notable um, experiences or circumstances that you remember from specific ones, just bring our viewers into what it's like to even make it to one. Let well, well, let me just tell you this. I have two stories to tell you, and they're one is about Buffalo with the Super Bowl with make, being on the team, and one is about the Broncos making t to the Super Bowl. So the first one was when I came out. And I was being interviewed by um, agents. 
they all said, oh, you're third or fourth round. So I said, okay. They all lied to you because they want you to sign with them, right? Because what happens if you do go in the third round? That's more money in their pocket, right? It's a business decision, right? So at the end of the day, I'm sitting there going, okay, I'm believing these guys. I think this is the case. You know, why shouldn't I be that high in the draft? But so I really didn't go. I didn't go the first day. And the second day, I got picked in the 10th round. And Marv Levy called me. And he said, hey, Mike, I uh, we just picked you in the 10th round. What do you think? And I'm not going to say what I said to him because I was really upset. I, <laughs> I basically said, what the blank took you so long? And then they let, they go, excuse me. I said, who's the D-line coach? And send me the playbook right now. That was my first thing to Marv Levy. He was like, wow. Wow. He was like, who do I have on the phone? This is a true story, Louie. Wow. And then so I go there. I'm third team. I get into a fight with a guy, and a guy named Chuck Dickerson was my coach, and he, I beat the guy up pretty good or whatever. It's, I don't want to talk about that. But he, he gave me a shot. And because I played at UCLA, I played in a 3-4, Rebecca, which is a true nose guard and two three-point defensive tackles. I played left defensive tackle. Bruce played right defensive tackle, but I knew how to play a seven technique and a five technique and a four eye. Your dad can tell you what that means. So Chuck took me and Bruce had his knee scope that year and he wasn't in training camp. He says, you're starting for Bruce the first game against the Giants. So I went against Jumbo Elliott, Reisen, yeah. remember Reisenberg, J Jumbo Elliott. And I did. I got two tackles for no gain, and the and the owner came up and said, "Hey, brother Rice, nice job, Mister. Uh, oh God, now I'm blanking on his name. Um, the owner for the Giants, or no, no, the owner for the Bills, uh, Ralph Wilson. He, he, so he knew I played, he, and he's a he's a Gross Point guy. He lived in Gross Point. He's got Ralph Wilson Insurance Agency. He's passed away now. You know that, I think. But so that that was my, and I made it. So I had a great first game. And then I beat Jim Lachey in a in a um, scrimmage at the stadium, and everybody loved me because I was balding and I looked like Mike Webster, and I was an old throwback, you know, and, and Buffalo guys. Wow! So so that propelled me. So now all of a sudden, there's four Super Bowls. Like I come out of my fourth year, Rebecca, and I'm batting a thousand going to the Super Bowl. Like what? What everybody isn't supposed to do that? I mean, I'm, I'm Mike Lotus, you know. So look at the irony with the draft and all that stuff. But it was that perseverance where I got the shot, and and I went to UCLA with a three four. Now I go to Denver after my first year there. They cut the nose guard that's going that came. His name is JJ, and they, George Dyer came up to me and said, "Hey, Mike, you're starting nose tackle for the '96 season." I was like, "What are you talking about?" JJ's coming. He goes, "No, we just caught him on the way to the airport." I was like, "What?" So I started the whole year. We went 13 and three, and we lost to Jacksonville in the second round of the playoffs because we had home field advantage, and we didn't have to be competitive for four weeks. We clinched home field advantage with three games to go in the regular season, which is a curse because now everybody kind of lets the air out a little bit. You got to keep the air up. You got every week. You got to keep just. You got to grind. You got four more weeks to go, right? So after that year, I didn't get signed back. I was done. Seven years in the league. That was it for me. Jumpy Gathers, who you know, Louie, was backing me up in 96. That next year, two weeks into training camp, I get a phone call from Mike Shanahan. He says, Mike, how you doing? I said, Coach, what's going on? He says, you ready to go? I said, what are you talking about? He goes, I'm on the field right now, and Jumpy just blew out his Achilles tendon. And I said, you got to be kidding me. He goes, I said, what about Mark Campbell, the second-round draft pick? He says, he can't play. He says, we're cutting him when you come in. Here's a million one for two years. We're going to pay you five fifty. I can't give you anything up front, but you're going to make the team. I said, send me the airplane ticket. I'm ready. Wow. And that was that was the two that that year and the next year were the Super Bowls. So that's how I got into those two Super Bowls, and we won them. So that's God working in, in mysterious ways. And he said, how much do you weigh? I said, well, about two sixty five. He says, can you be two eighty? I said, I can be two eighty in about eight days. You know, no problem. <laughs> you know, I can just start eating. And so I went, and that was it. And then I played four more years. So interesting! Wow, what a story! Thank you for sharing, Jumpy yes. Gathers. Remember, Jumpy Gather? I remember we played with the Redskins. He was known for the forklift. Yes, that yes. guy could take you uh, and take you to the quarterback. Any any lineman in the league, he could do like that. that. Like that. He was six foot seven, Rebecca. He was three hundred pounds. He was the darkest brother's skin color, like dark. He looked evil. He had the widow's peak. 
He had the long chin, and he'd go, hey, Mike, you want to come with me? Like, he'd always mess with me, but he loved me. Like, I love Jumpy, right? But he was a really dark brother, his skin color, and he was so strong that just like your dad said, he had a forklift move. He would dip and bring his arm underneath your dad's armpit, and I've seen him ragdoll 320-pound men. Wow. Like, and he's six seven, three hundred 300 pounds, and he shredded. He's not fat at all. And he's, he's strong. And I remember the other time the weight coach said to him, hey, Jumpy, will you come in and do some benches with us? He goes, coach, I don't need to bench. He goes, he goes I, there, I was working out and I had like 365 on, which is 345s and a quarter. I was doing like triples or whatever. And, he's, and he said, if you can lift that one time without warming up, you don't have to come in. He says, no problem. He got on the bench press. He said, Coach, I'm not going to lift it one time, and he's resting it on his chest. He goes, I'm going to do it five times. Boom, boom, boom. And he says, I'm going to take off now, okay? He goes, no problem. We'll see you later, John. <laughs> the guy had, like, incredible, like, he had oak strength. Like, yeah, Herculean strength. strength. Herculean. That's a great a great adjective. Fantastic. So that's, that's kind of – I had some characters. And, and so you ask about the six Super Bowls. It was a blessing. <laughs> It was incredible. And to me, I was hoping I was an inspiration to all those guys that were backups to say, hey, look, just keep working hard. If you make a team, you give yourself a chance to do something great, you know, and yeah. that's what it is. Yes, we make our plans. The Lord determines our steps. And it's evident you were destined, you know, to. to I don't know about to have a maybe. Record, no, and the fact that you are so humble and you can speak so inspirationally. Uh, to others, because even for me, I clearly do not play football, but what it is that you're saying and as you are describing your journey uh, is definitely very encouraging uh, to me, and I'm sure many others are very exhorted by your words. So, Mike, as you know, uh, Sharp Talk is about football, family, friendship, faith, and fun. Uh, yeah. You mentioned your family earlier, but I just also wanted to hear more about um, you know, how important family is to you, the friendships that you've been able to cultivate over the years while you were in the league and now even life after. Share with us how those sure. relationships have helped to shape you into the man you are today. Well, I I'm just going to go out there and say that, you know, hey, Max, come here. No, oh, yeah, this is my son. We'd love this to my son, that. yeah. So this is Lewis Sharp and his daughter. I'm on a, on a uh, interview we're doing now. Uh, Okay, so this is my son. Come on, jump Hi. in here. Hi, man. That's my son. Hi. He's a he's a hockey player. This is Lewis Sharp and his daughter Rebecca. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Congratulations on your outstanding academic and athletic success at Brother Rice. Thank you. No, I right. appreciate it. That's a legend right there. Thirteen years in the NFL, man. <laughs> he, he blocked LT pretty good. Let me tell you. So, so anyway, so family. I mean, it's everything, right? I mean. You know, so we can all say that, but what I want to say is I hope people that are watching this know that if you got tough issues with your family, don't think you're not alone. Everybody does. I, I do. We have tough issues at the Lotus family. You got tough issues at the Sharp family. You just got to work through it, but you got to be able to talk the tough talk. Yeah, that's good. You got to be able to talk the tough talk, right? So, so to me, you know, my son is my world and my, my fiance is my world, Beth, who's my high school sweetheart. We rekindled after 25 years. Wow, what a yeah, story. She's fantastic. She's uh, uh, probably outside of Max being born. Uh, me getting back together with her is one of the greatest things in the world, probably, if not better than winning the Super Bowl. So, wow. so it's just that's of the importance of, you know, you, you want to have your special, you know, your, your soulmate with you and. You know, she loves me when I'm down. She loves me when I'm up. And when we get after one another, we it doesn't last very long. And everybody has arguments and, you know, but, but uh, you know, faith for me is um, I was raised Catholic. I believe that God has a plan for all of us. And I believe Jesus died for my sins. But I'm not much of a – the church thing for me is, you know, the Catholic side of things. I see a lot of hypocrisy in religion and sort of things, you know. So to me, um, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. He died for us, and I believe he's a real person. But I believe in spiritually worshiping to my own drum, you know. And, and so 
I hope God believes that I'm born again, you know, but I know he wants me to go out there and practice the word and teach the word to other people and spread that message. But, uh, and I'm, I'm trying, you know, I'm trying. I, 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 I'm trying. Uh, you know, I don't know if I'd call it great work, Rebecca, but it's, well, it's, it's a start. A mission, so I definitely believe that it's great work and it is needed in these parallel yeah. times more than ever. Yeah. So, so family is a lot really important. Um, but, you know, most importantly, communication within your organization has to be critical. And it, sometimes it's tough communication. Sometimes it's, you know, you know, you got to get after it a little bit and, and people don't like that. And, and unfortunately, you know, you got to figure out that balance. You got to figure out how to be the best dad I can be because, you know, we've all, we all can go through setbacks in our lives. Uh, but the key is, is if you get knocked down or something happens, the key is to get up one leg at a time, take one foot in front of the other. It's not going to be an easy road, but we managed to get it done and we're working it out and everything's good in our lives uh, with my family and all that because there's some dysfunction in everybody's family. But but as a whole, I believe uh, that I'm here for a reason and yeah. I'm trying to, every day I figure, try to figure it out, make sure I know that path. So. Hey, my, my, I don't know if you're looking for a good hit for Coco. Um, I, I nominate you being the great communicator uh, that you are, the leader of men. I nominate Mike Lotus as new head football coach well, of the Lions. I got to be honest with you. I don't want that job. <laughs> well, thank you for transparency. We yeah, well, I mean, I don't want that job because – I think the organ is – see, Lewis, I don't know about – you know, you played with the Cardinals, and, I mean, they've, they've ramped up over the last 20 years. You know, they usually were – the you know, St. Louis Cardinals, they started, right, with with, with Del – no, who's the guy uh, – who's the ex-University of Michigan offensive lineman that's on TV for CBS? Dan you know, Deardorff. Dan Deardorff. There it is. And uh, – you know, he's a Michigan guy and all that stuff. But, you know, like Tampa Bay, you know, was always the bottom of the barrel. But they won a Super Bowl. Look, Phoenix, you know, Phoenix came in there and, you know, Larry Fitzgerald. And they started pumping some great athletes in there. You know, you know, look at Tampa Bay. They won a Super Bowl with Mike Allstott and Lynch and all these guys. You know, if they can do it, why can't the Lions? And the Lions just have never seemed to be able to do that or at least be competitive as a as – a, uh, postseason participant, you know? So I wouldn't want it because I think the upper management at the Detroit Lions needs to leave the reins to a professional football mind, like a Mike Shanahan and a Bill Polian, to build a team. Bill Polian was the Buffalo Bills GM, Rebecca, and he was the GM at the Indianapolis Colts when they went and won the Super Bowls. And, you know, you know, Seasons for we were talking just the other day their recent uh, performance. This is the first time they've made it to the playoffs since 1995. What are your thoughts for the team? Well, you know, I gotta tell you, I've been I played at many places, and there's the the NFL fans. I believe in, in the world, there's two sets of fans that are the best. Professional soccer in Europe, you know, FIFA, you know, that those people are absolutely crazy, okay? And then the NFL fans, okay? The NFL fans, and, and they're all crazy everywhere. But th there's a couple of places specifically that are really crazy. One of them is Buffalo. The other one is Oakland, okay? And Kansas City's pretty gnarly, too. Now, Philadelphia is pretty good, too. They're, they're crazy. But in other words... The people that are close to you as a player, right, Louie? How many times do you get told you were terrible and, you know, by fans and screaming at you and flipping you the bird? And, I mean, all the time, all the time. I got hit in the head with a battery in Oakland. So we had to wear our helmets and look to the field. You you couldn't look back at the at, – you know, you'd come off and you'd look – kind of look around and start gazing and stuff, you know. So so the – the, the I, 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 I then the Denver Bronco fans are huge too. But – I believe that the Bills Mafia is unbe unbelievable, unbelievable fan base. The number one in the NFL, they say. Wow. And, and they're, they're there at 8 o'clock in the morning on a 1 o'clock Sunday game. 
They're drinking Fireball and Rumple Mints at nine. They're drunk by ten thirty, and they're absolutely crazy. Not that I'm promoting alcohol use. I'm just saying this is what they do. And I remember when the Dolphins came in in the winter time in December, they were just pelting the buses with snowballs. You're in Buffalo. This is see, this is war. And you know when when you have that sort of fan base as a football player or as a competitor, period. And, and you know, Lou, it, you, it resonates in your heart as a player, right? Just like if you're a performer and that crowd's rocking you, and it drives a performer on stage, you know, or they're just kind of dead in their seats. When they're going crazy and they're, ah, you know, and they're, you guys are awesome, and they're screaming, <laughs> you know, they're falling all over one another and they just oh, have a blast, you know? And you're just like, we got to get this done for them. Let's go and our team and our boys. Let's go and our families. Let's go. We got we got a lot riding on our shoulders here. So it's 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 what I mean. The NFL fan base is excellent. You know? But we don't have fans this year, right? Due to COVID nineteen, so they still managed to make it uh, to their first playoff appearance since nineteen ninety five. What are you expecting to see from the team during this time? Well, I'll tell you, yesterday's game was fantastic. And, and Frank Wright is the head coach at the Indianapolis Colts, who was a quarterback on my team for five years, and, and who's an excellent coach. And he's got Rusty Jones over there, our strength coach, you know, still. And so he's still in the league. But, but at the end of the day, uh, the Bills found a way to win. And they got robbed. If you, if you saw the game yesterday, uh, a receiver for the, uh, for the Colts caught the ball picked it up, picked his knee up, and then they stripped it, and they called it a catch, and he was down, and the game would have been over then. But eventually it was over, and the Bills won. But the Bills won, I think, 27 to 24, and it was uh, just a hard-fought playoff January game that, you know, I I remember playing in a lot, you know. For me, with my experience, the six – You know, I was in the playoffs for seven or eight years out of my 11 years, and there's four different speeds in the NFL. There's preseason speed, there's regular season speed, there's playoff speed, and then there's a Super Bowl speed, you know, of the players and the way we move and how quickly we execute our our, – our responsibilities on each play. So yeah, yeah, wonderful. Thank you so yeah. much. Um, and again, you said you shared with us a tremendous amount um, about your career, both at Brother Rice and then, of course, um, at UCLA and throughout the NFL. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Mark, we want to know what are you up to today? We, I, I read some stories about peanut brittle. Oh um, no! Our, our viewers to know. <laughs> what the work that you're doing in the current day. Oh, that's so nice. So it's National Peanut Brittle Day pretty soon here. Let's, really? Uh, What's I, doing? I, I, think think they, I, I think they're going to come out with a National Fedora Day, and you'll fit right in, Louie. You'll be all set. With the <laughs> Trust me. Yeah, I see him on Facebook all the time. It's great. Oh, yes. Facebook. <laughs> you know who you remind me of? You remind me of a guy named Tony Jones, T-Bone. You have these flamboyant suits, and the hat <laughs> matches the suit. Bone, Bone would come and he, we call him Bone, T-Bone, right? So Tony Jones, he's the greatest guy in the world. He, he played right tackle uh, next to Gary Zimmerman. And your dad can tell you about Gary Zimmerman. He's another guy. But but T-Bone would come in with a cane and white, it, it, like a royal blue suit and a royal blue hat. And then he'd come in with a red suit and a red hat. And we were like, Bone, Bone's in the town. You know, he'd say, you know what I mean, Lo? he called me Lo, hello. For, I had multiple nicknames yeah yeah but it was really it was it was i was we'd all wait for bones outfit you know we'd wait for t-bone to come in dressed and it's it's cool so but you know what am i doing now i work for a company called cloverdale equipment company okay okay and uh mr todd moylan and family owns the cloverdale equipment company and what we do is we are in the construction business so we We're not heavy equipment. Like you've seen those big yellow caterpillar machines that move dirt, whether it's an excavator or a a backhoe or a bulldozer or something. That's called dirt. We do just below that. We do man lifts, like scissor lifts. When they bring the scissor lift up with the guy videotaping, Louie and I doing one-on-one pass rush, we rent those types of machines. We rent forklifts, heavy forklifts, (laughs) uh, big cranes. Uh, big like RT, they're called rough terrain cranes, um, 
and then what we call boom lifts. So I'll show you a quick card, and this will give you an idea of some of the equipment that we use, that we have. So that yellow piece is a crane. It's called a flat deck crane, and that orange piece is a telehandler. So you'll see that's rough terrain with the big wheels. The flat deck crane usually uh, is in like GM's plant or Chrysler's plant because the plants are so tight they need something narrow but can boom out and lift machinery and stuff. So it's huge business, multi, multi hundreds of millions of dollars. It's called heavy equipment, but we're like medium to lightweight equipment. Okay. But so I've 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 gotten uh, I've been into that for a year, and you know it took me about ten years to deprogram. I had some uh, I enjoyed myself for a while. Uh, Louie and I have talked about some things, and and uh, you know it's it's you get a grip on life, and you get a grip on what you're doing and what you're not doing, and what you're supposed to be doing. And, uh, you know, I was blessed to uh, be pulled out of some darkness. So, uh, yeah. So, and I don't mind sharing stuff like that. You know, I was probably drinking a little too much coming out of the league because uh, the Jets weren't flying over me anymore. What am, who am I? What am I going to do? I, I'm sure you've, you know, I'm, I guarantee you've thought that about yourself, Louie, and you've had in your, in, your, in your journey of life. And, yeah, yeah, and, and and amen, and and to me, I'm just blessed to be in the position right this second talking to both of you uh, because, you know, there's been, I just, I started to go down a wrong path for a while, and something brought me out of it. I don't know what it was, but I can say God or whatever, but maybe just a divine intervention you know, with myself, but, um, and I'm not saying that I was like addicted to anything or anything, but I'm just saying I was starting to get, who am I? What am I? I mean, yeah. Rebecca, yeah. I, I don't know if your dad's ever talked to you, but you know, for, for including foot college, 17 years of, I got class at eight. I got taping at two 30. I got to be on the field at three. We got meetings afterwards and I got to go do my homework. Then the pros, I got to be in a special teams at 7:30. We got team meeting at 8:45. We got breakout meeting. You know, everything was structured, Rebecca. Yeah. So, so when you get out and you're still a kid, look, we were just a bunch of kids playing football. I don't care if you're 34 years old or not. You're still just a big kid. You're goofy, right? You're out there screwing around, and you you get to you know your sense of reality is warped. You know, with everyday life that you have to uh, deal with as a, what I call a civilian, a non NFL player, right? You're a civilian. We're, you know, we go to war, we're soldiers, we're, you know, however you want to say it. Um, but the, the hardest thing is to figure out your path when you're done. If you've yeah. been like a 10 year guy, like Louie and I have been or more, you know, so it, it's tough. It can, it can be very, very difficult. Now the NFL, it, sorry, I know you want to say something, but Louie, when you came out, they didn't have all the support systems exactly. that you had, that we have now in the NFL for the guys. And, mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the part of the NFL that really bothers me is your dad came in and paved the way for me. That I helped along with my brother in at the time, paved the way for the other cats to come in and get it done. And then, but there's a lack of respect in this brotherhood that I see with ownership and management or in labor. Yeah. And that to me is what's sad is they knew that banging your head against something and giving you a concussion would hurt you. They knew this in 1994 and they didn't tell us this. Because what if you got three concussions? You might look at your wife and go, you know, this could kill me now. And now that they've told me, I got to leave. But they didn't want to do that. They wanted to. They wanted to wring you out like a rag to get every drop of water out of you. And they didn't care what happened. And mm -hmm. so for me, the, the disgrace of the NFL is you're not taking care of the guys that built the $14 billion organization. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you. I mean, I'm a straight shooter. We're with you. Yeah, We're exactly. with you. Look, it, they gave us 1.5. Let me say one more thing. They gave us $1.5 billion for the concussion settlement, right? Okay. Why not break off Louie and I a couple hundred grand? You know, who knows if we're banged up? We don't know, and that's where they're falling behind is saying, 
well, we don't know until you're dead until we autopsy his brain or my brain. Well, that's too late now. Where's my money? You know, that I could help my family deal with me when I become a caged savage. Or, oh, you know, no. you, well, you don't, you don't know what, how it's going to look at Junior Seau. He took a gun and shot himself in the chest because he, he didn't want, he knew he was screwed up. He didn't want to shoot himself in the head. He wanted his brain to get examined. My buddy Shane Dronette shot himself. Five years after he left the league, he thought that he had to go pick up his daughter at the airport at 2 o'clock in the morning. And he's like, no, honey, I'm leaving. And he couldn't deal with it anymore, and he ended his life in, in his mm -hmm. Yeah, so so it's a very sobering reality. You know, we get a chance to talk about all of the wonderful things that come along with being a part of the National Football League, but there are there's another side. There's to a dark game. side to the game. Yeah, yeah, and so there thanks is. for being so vulnerable and transparent, and just allowing our viewers to really hear some of the, the inner workings, and then of course what life after the league looks like. But again, we thank you for your service and for your transparency. I yeah. think you're a great friend for my father. Oh, he's the man. Really inspirational interview today. You know, uh, and, and Mike, uh, you know, I, I played with Dave Dorson. Um, he came and played with the Cardinals after he left the Bears. Yeah, I know. Andre Waters, uh, another player. Andre Waters. I remember oh, stories. Yeah, I remember playing against uh, uh, Junior Seau. He's a great linebacker. Yeah. Um, I have to say this. If there was one player, and I played against LT, I played against Richard Dent, I played against Charles Haley. If there was one defensive end that was unblockable was Bruce Smith. I agree with that. He could not block. He was so strong, so fast, and he had that spin move that you and he and so him. fluid, so fluid. He was unblockable. Yeah. I remember I played against Bruce Smith in uh, the 1987 Pro Bowl. Could not block him at all. Could not, he embarrass me? He embarrassed me. Great talent. Sounds like a tremendously great person, and uh, I agree wholeheartedly with you. Give us a couple hundred thousand dollars because it, it is post-mortem that you can identify this yeah. PPE that's caused by repetitive head trauma. Give us a couple hundred thousand dollars, those of us that help make the game a $14 billion. Yeah, yeah. like Eddie DeBartolo would do or or a uh, Art Rooney, you know, the senior Art Rooney or a, 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 a Al Davis. These are three owners that I'm saying – that take care of their players mm -hmm. and take care of them afterwards, Rebecca. Yeah, which is if very they're hurting, they would they would make a phone call to them and they would be there for them. Wow, they're a family. Not a, it's all business now, you know. And 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 so, look, I'm not discrediting the the ownership because if I'm in an ownership position, I'm not guaranteeing your contract either because you're one play away from ending your career. Okay. Which means I'm liable, right? So on a business side of it, I get it, but where's the morality side yeah. and the ethical yeah. side and the, and the, and the, the appreciation for, you know, I don't know if you know this, but he was an offensive tackle. So he, he banged around with a lot of guys, but when you're in the middle and you got to deal with 650 pounds, it's a whole different world. I'm going to tell you right now, his world is brutal because he's got Derek Thomas, Bruce Smith. He has some, he's going to pucker him up a little bit. You know, he's got to be ready. Now I got to deal with just straight abuse. Every play. Every play. In practice uh, every, and, and in the game. Practice. And, then you, and you can't break me off something you don't think my brain. I mean, they know this. They know this for a fact. Maybe greater redemption is to come. I mean, at this point, after the unprecedented year we saw in 2020, anything is possible. Miss Sharp, I nominate you to represent us for that. Hey, I'm here. You know, I'm definitely uh, passionate and fervent and educated on the topic, both experientially and via the book. So you never know what type of partnerships could emerge. I just want to know if you're a bulldog, though. If you latch on, you're not letting go. <laughs> <laughs> Time blood. will tell. It's in her blood. It's in her I blood. figured that, but I want her to tell me that. But she's, <laughs> she's just going to come in with that beautiful smile and just go, I want to crush you here. <laughs> so, so no, that, that's great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you interview, Mike. Uh, All you right, you're the best. Very enlightening. I feel like, uh, like I'm a better person as a result of listening 
uh, to your inspirational uh, message and, and talk. Thank you so much. And the message of fortitude and resilience and, you know, being born for such a time as this. So thanks to Max, who came on as well and said All hello. Right. We wish you and your family a very um, happy new year. And again, just believing for greater days to come here in 2021. Thank you, Mike. And they will thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Louis. And uh, I wish you nothing but the best in your endeavors and what you're seeking to become. Uh, I think the world is your oyster and you're just a lovely person and your your heart is wonderful. And, and I know you learned a lot of that from your dad, you know. So, so at the end of the day, uh, you know, it's been wonderful and, and, and whatever I can do to help propel you, Rebecca, and your career, I would be more than willing to have it. But the last thing I want to say, <laughs> yeah, no worries. And the last thing that I want to say about anybody is don't sell yourself short, look at yourself and be okay with who you are, but learn to decide what you want to do and give it 110% effort, 110% of the time, because if you do that, when I coach football, you won't be a what if person. Well, geez, what if I would have done this? It's called regret. Yeah. yeah. And we all have regrets, but we want to minimize the regrets. So on behalf of me and the Lotus family and who we are, we're honored to be a, a part of your show. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I can just tell you, uh, Louis, I look forward to even building a better friendship with you and Rebecca. I hope one day we get a chance to maybe go have lunch together with you and Louie and Beth and maybe bring Max or something, but that would be really nice. And and I just want to say that uh, I'm, I'm glad to see that the world is starting to change. I think that needs to happen. Um, and I, I think that, uh, again, if we all just come together on an everyday basis and, and learn to be happy, say something nice to somebody during the day, do something nice and look through clear lenses, not colored lenses, this world is going to be a good deal because I think the democratic procedures are good. Uh, even though I vote a little bit here and I vote over here and I'm over here, but I think, uh, you know, we're starting to go in the right direction and it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. but everybody's got to live in society and obey the rules the same way. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Hey, hey, Mike, uh, thank you for that uh, inspiring message that you just gave. Uh, we are on the, on the better path. I want to ask if you can, uh, we're going to send you our address. If you can send a, an autograph a picture of you uh, to my brother-in-law, uh, we'll give you his name. He's a huge NFL football fan. And certainly appreciate that very much. If I, if I, 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 I think I have a few, I can muster some <laughs> up, but I have a few extra cards. So just in case I got cards for him too. So if that, if I don't have a picture, but that would be I, awesome. the bottom of my heart, thank you very much. Uh, may God be with all of you always on every single minute you live and every single yeah. second. Amen. And, and yeah. just keep, keep working hard. It's great Thank to you see so you. Thank you so much, Mike. Take care. Yeah. Bye. Always. Be well. Love you, brother. Be Take well. care. All righty. So, Dad, that was such a motivating interview. I really appreciate all of Mike's very powerful sentiments. I took copious notes, so I plan to really take a look at them and, like I said, integrate them into my own life, but I wanted us to stick around just with our uh, viewers because I want to know what you're looking forward to in season two of Sharp Talk, Dad. Well, in season two, I thought uh, that that was a, a very a very candid, um, uh, forthcoming interview with uh, Mike Lotus, very inspiring, and and the fact that he can identify with the commoner, the everyday person. Are we still on? Yeah, we are still on. And uh, and that, you know, some of the stories that he told that, you know, being an undersized uh, defensive lineman come, coming out of college, a 10th round draft pick, you know, he always believed in himself. He always yeah. believed in himself. He always put the work in. He never neglected the work that he needed to do to be successful. And as a result of that, never quit attitude. You know, quitting just simply does not exist. And one of the things that my high school coach once told me, winners, winners never quit. And quitters never win. So I, I still have that mentality and the warrior mentality that you have to have, whether it be going out there on that NFL football field or whether it be in, in, in business, uh, whatever it is that you do, you have to be a warrior. You have to see yourself as a winner and you have to recognize that, yeah, you're not going to win all the time. But when you don't win, you lose, you pick yourself up. And because you believe in who you are and you believe in what you're doing. You pick yourself up, you learn the lessons that you need to learn, and you move forward. You move forward and you don't quit until you win. 
because you are a winner. You are an overcomer. You are victorious. You yes. are the head and not the tail. Okay, come Above on. only and never been. I feel a preach coming on. and wonderfully created. Come on now. All right. Look, well, amen, Pastor Sharp. Yes, that was wonderful. And I definitely. Does that answer your question? It does. You know, and it makes me think of one of, you know, my favorite scriptures, Romans 8, 28, that all things, God will take all things. All means all, and he will work them together for our good and his glory because we love him. And I've been called according to his purpose. I'm looking forward to more great conversations. This has been really edifying for me to hear from legends of the league and the gridiron glory that we get a chance to display here. We've got a lot of really exciting guests coming on. So we just want to thank you all for your continued encouragement, your prayers, your support, your engagement. It really, really means a lot. And we we are hopeful that Sharp Talk will continue to bring you great content on football, faith, family, friendship, and fun. Um, and on a personal note, I do want to share that I am going to be kicking off a new segment here in Sharp Talk around courageous conversation. So that will begin in February. And again, just looking forward to sharing this platform with incredible people that have remarkable stories. And I know they will be inspiring, motivating, and just shine some light in the midst of the perilous and dark times that we are living in. So please stay tuned. There is so, so, so much more to come. We love you, family. May the Lord bless you and keep you, be gracious to you, lift up the light of his countenance unto you and give you peace. Take peace, care. peace. Stay safe. <laughs>